Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Pastor Kurt Taylor, uh, an old friend of Pastor Pets. He and I went to a college together. And um, uh, I was a pastor uh, at a Lutheran church uh, just south of Brilliant. How many know where Brilliant is? Okay. I was in a church uh, in uh, Rantoul, Potter, which is a small town right by it. Trinity Rantoul. How do you know Trinity Rantoul? Uh, my grandparents are from Brilliant. What was their last name? 
Furman, yes, okay, we had, yes, we knew the Furmans, a uh, lot of, everybody, they say that Rantoul was kind of like quack grass, everybody was related somehow uh, at Rantoul. I was there uh, for 10 years, uh, from uh, 93 to 03, then I went to um, St. John's Lutheran Church uh, in Waltz, Michigan, just south of Detroit, but remained uh, a Green Bay Packer fan there in the lion's den. And uh, three years ago, I was called to be a professor at Concordia, Wisconsin, and I've been teaching there now for the last three years, and as Pastor Pett knows, there aren't many preachers that aren't working on Christmas, but if you're a college instructor, then chances are you have Christmas off, so he asked me to come. And um, I've been in touch with him a little bit, not uh, in the last week or so, but after the surgery, and I was happy to hear of his uh, the success of that. Uh, he is an old friend and he is the pipeline for Packer tickets for me. Um, someone here uh, offered them to him and then he offered them to me a couple of times last season for the Raiders game and then the Seattle playoff game and I couldn't have been more happy. So I love Paul and uh, I wish him the best of health uh, but then there's that selfish part of me to get back to full strength, Paul, so we can go back to Packer games together. It's an honor to be here uh, with you at Redeemer, and I pray God's blessings on our worship uh, this afternoon. I believe we begin now with the Old Testament reading. The Old Testament reading is Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the training warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God.
behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, For that which is conceived in her, is from the Holy Spirit. she will bear a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Spirit and the Church cry out, all those who await his appearance pray. Come, Lord Jesus. The whole creation pleads. Come, Lord Jesus. Let us pray.
Let us pray. We praise and thank you, O God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, that you have enlightened us by revealing the light that never fades. Night has fallen and day's allotted span draws to a close. The daylight which you created for our pleasure has fully satisfied us, and yet of your free gift now the evening lights do not fail us. We praise you and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him be honor, glory, and power to you in the Holy Spirit, now and always, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the intro it. The people who walked in darkness, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. The people who walked in darkness, those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness.
The epistle is from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and world passion, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. This is the word of the Lord. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and, the shall be upon his shoulders. and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sing to the Lord a new song. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. All right. Hello, everyone. It is getting close to Christmas, and I have some Christmas presents. And we're going to open one of them, and you are going to decide which one you want me to open. So, first, these two kind of come together, but they're small. I'm going to describe them to you as best as I can. They're small, don't really make any more noise, pretty light. Um, if I could guess, it's pr it kind of feels a little bit circular in both of them. So option number one. Oh, hold on. Clean Xbox. <laughs> <coughs> option number two, we got bigger, the biggest one I have, really. This one says Merry Christmas, so that's, that's a nice one. Not too heavy, but, you know, I can, I can hold it pretty, pretty well. Square, rectangular, all right, option. And finally, the last one, also kind of the same shape, but shinier paper and a little bit heavier than the biggest one. So, out of these, which one do you think I should open? We got the light ones, we got option number one, the smaller ones, anybody, yeah? Okay, the second one, we got the biggest one, nice paper there, yeah? Or the last one, the shiny paper, yeah? Oh wow, a lot of people like the shiny paper, right? All right, well, I'm gonna disappoint you all. I'm not gonna open any of those, actually. I'm gonna open this uh, tissue box here. Because in the tissue box, is my little baby Jesus for my nativity. Oh yeah, you were probably thinking at the beginning, oh, Alex, you just messed up and put your tissue box in there with the presents. Whoopsie, you know, everybody makes mistakes. But no, I did that on purpose. And yes, inside, I have the baby Jesus. And yeah, all these presents look great. They're fancy, they're shiny, right? We make them look all nice and wrap them up. But no one was really expecting something great to come out of the tissue box, right? And that is how Christmas works, right? We like to make things look nice. We gotta get all the presents ready. We gotta get all the food ready. We gotta get our house ready, all these different things. Make it all look all nice. But if we look back at the first Christmas when Jesus was actually born, it was plain, it was simple. and. Some people might actually think it was maybe a little gross or messy, right? Because he was not born in an awesome hospital. He was born in a place that was probably just kind of off the side of the road because they were traveling, right? And built or born around all these animals, things like that. 
And so it was very ordinary, plain, and not what you expected. But it was still great. It is the greatest gift of all. And so, yeah, I'm sure you're still wondering what are in these gifts. So am I. They're my actual Christmas presents. But <laughs> we look towards the greatest gift of all, which is Jesus Christ, our Savior, because that is the most important gift. And it doesn't need to be wrapped up in a box. It doesn't need to be looking all fancy and shiny and things like that. But it is a wonderful gift because Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for us. That is why he came to us on Christmas, and that is why we celebrate his birth. So let's fold our hands and say a prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to us on Christmas Day, for being our Savior and taking away our sins. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray. Speak, O Lord, thy servant heareth to thy word, we now give heed. Life and spirit thy word beareth, all thy word is true indeed. Death's dread power to us gives strife. Jesus, may thy word of life fill our souls with love's strong fervor that we cling to thee forever. Amen. I'm told Pastor Pet usually walks around when he preaches, is that right? I might do that, because we've got the sun <laughs> right in my eyes. In the name of Jesus, amen. One of the great things about the season of Advent, which we are concluding, is that we get back into the Old Testament a lot. And in the Old Testament, we see this thread that runs through, which leads to this day, this Christmas Eve day. We see this thread beginning all the way back in the book of Genesis. What should God have done when Adam and Eve committed their first sin? We know that God created the heavens and the earth and it was good. And then he created humanity and it was very good. And then into all of this perfection that God had created, humanity introduced sin infected the world with sin by being disobedient to God, infected everything at their time, and it has infected everything in our time so that you and I and all people, except one, are born sinful. What should God have done in reaction to the first sin? We know what he did. He showed love. 
And in Genesis 3.15, God said that he was going to send an offspring of Adam and Eve who would crush the devil's head, and in the process, the devil would strike his heel. That was a direct prophecy to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Already in Genesis 3, on the heels of the first sin, God was promising this, what we celebrate today. And then throughout the Old Testament, that thread continued. The thread continued to, to widen. It became more and more elaborate. We see prophecies being made. We see a covenant being made with Abraham. We see prophecies happening. We see things happening through Moses and, and Isaiah saying wonderful things about this coming Savior. In fact, it even got so specific in the Old Testament that we're told exactly where the Savior would be born. In Bethlehem, it says in Micah. All the way through, the Old Testament was a thread of promise. <laughs> which culminates on Good Friday and Easter, but which we celebrate the fulfillment of today. In the New Testament, God wasted no time, like the opening notes to a great symphony. An angel appeared to Zechariah to tell him that his son, John the Baptist, would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And then an angel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was going to have a child who would be the savior of the world. And then an angel appeared to Joseph, telling him to take Mary as his wife and that their son, Jesus, would be the Savior. And then God led Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. You know the story, the wonderful true story about how the child was born, how the angels sang, how the shepherds came to visit. This was the promise being fulfilled. This is salvation in action. That's what you and I celebrate today. We celebrate salvation coming into this world, first as a child in a manger, and then on a cross and an open tomb. Much has been said about the simplicity of Jesus' birth. We heard it here in the children's message. Those of you that grew up in the church, I am sure that at some point during your growing up in the church, you heard it talked about how it didn't seem fitting that the God of the universe should come into the world in this way, in such a humble way, in such a, a mean way, that a, a much, much more a regal surrounding would have been more appropriate, more pomp, more ceremony, more riches, but it wasn't. It was very simple, wasn't it? Not just humble, but simple. It was just Mary and Joseph and a baby who was lying in a manger. That's Christmas. The angels sang. The shepherds came to visit. But the, the, the foundation of Christmas is very simple. It symbolizes a lot. The fact that Jesus was born like this symbolizes and means so much. I mean, for one thing, it shows that Jesus was not coming into the world to be a world conqueror, but to be a servant. The simplicity of his birth shows that Jesus was going to be a common person like, like everyone else, not to rule over them, but to be one of us. I mean, the, this, the simplicity of Jesus' birth symbolizes even how he would die as a criminal, Convicted of sin, carrying the sins of the world on himself. The simplicity of that birth instructs us a lot, especially this year. You and I do this too. We know the Christmas story, but we've, we always add a lot to it. We always add a lot to Christmas, don't we? What is Christmas usually for us? Christmas is uh, often um, uh, parties and uh, family gatherings and uh, maybe it's travel, big dinners, lots of presents. I don't know if there's some sort of philosophical truth to this about if, if you make something more, then it actually becomes less. And that when something is less, it actually has the potential of being more. 
I mean, think about it. Look at all the things that Christmas has become for us because of what we've added to it. And what happens if some of those things are missing? Does that mean it's not Christmas? I wonder how many of you have said this. I know I have thought it. This virus-infected Christmas, we're not going to have all the things that we usually have. We're not going to be able to do all the things that we usually do. It's not going to look the same. And I wonder how many of us have said to ourselves or muttered under our breath or said out loud or just thought, ah, this isn't really going to be much of a Christmas. Or at least said this Christmas won't be the same. All those other things are fine. Those things that we add to Christmas, they're fun, they're enjoyable, they're pleasurable. But are all those other things Christmas? Will it be Christmas this year? 2020 for you. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa. And if I'd have thought about it, I would have brought you a picture. I, this first time I preached in Green Bay. And I have a picture of me as a kindergartner wearing a Green Bay Packer jacket. <laughs> I grew up a Packer fan in Des Moines, Iowa. I just thought I had to say that. It has nothing to do with the sermon. Let's move on. <laughs> So I grew, up, I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and um, uh, I remember so clearly what, what Christmas was, was like and what it was supposed to be like there in Des Moines. Great, great childhood, no question about it, and Christmas Eve was always the same for us in the Taylor house. There were four of us, my mom and dad and my sister and me, and Christmas Eve we'd have pork ribs for dinner, I don't know. Does anybody in here have pork ribs on Christmas Eve? Yeah, no, I think it's an Iowa thing. You got to have pork on Christmas. And so we had pork on Christmas Eve, and then we'd get cleaned up from the pork ribs, and we'd go to church. And we would always go to the same church, Mount Olive Lutheran Church and School in Des Moines, Iowa. And we'd drive the same route. And you know, as I think back on it, how there must have been snow and on the ground and snow gently falling as you as you drive into church, and their church where I had been, I had grown up there all my life, I had been there, I knew everybody, everybody knew me. You walk into the church and all your friends are there, the friends I go to grade school with, all the families were there that our family knew, and we'd all be smiling and happy because we were in our familiar church, and then, and then our familiar pastor would come out, he was pastor for most of my childhood, and preach the same message and read the same readings and sing the same Christmas songs. And then when church was over, my mom would always be off talking to some of her friends, and I'd be around talking to my friends. Some of them already got to open their presents on Christmas Eve, and I had to wait until Christmas morning. But we'd talk, and then it was time to go. My dad was always wanting to go, and so we'd go, and we'd drive home. But we'd go through this particular neighborhood where it was all lit up with Christmas lights, all the houses were decorated, and we'd go through that neighborhood and enjoy the lights, and there'd be somebody dressed in a Santa outfit handing out candy to children, and then we'd go home, and my mom would warm up some hot chocolate, and we would have pumpkin bread and cream cheese and listen to Christmas music and sit around the tree until it was time to go to bed. That was Christmas. When I was in college down at Concordia, Wisconsin, my parents moved out to Las Vegas. We've had family in Las Vegas since the 50s. It's really kind of a second hometown for me now. But they moved out to Las Vegas uh, late, uh, mid-80s when I was in college, and I knew even though my dad said, I'll fly you home for Christmas, I knew it wasn't going to be the same. In fact, I was already figuring that I wasn't going to enjoy this one. And so I went, uh, flew back there and landed a Christmas Eve morning, and it was like 60 degrees outside, and my dad said, come on, let's go out and golf. They lived on a golf course, and I hate golf, but we go out there, and it's like, it's, but it's 60 degrees, and I'll never forget, as I was standing there, I was thinking, I am golfing on Christmas Eve. There wasn't any snow on the ground, it was all desert. 
time to go to church, no pork rib dinner. We drove through the neighborhoods and uh, I mean, instead of seeing houses decorated with Christmas lights, you saw casinos and the lights of Las Vegas on the way to church. We arrived at Mountain View Lutheran Church right next to a big Las Vegas casino. The lights of Christmas were from Arizona Charlie's Casino and the marquee which advertised dancing girls as we're walking into Christmas Eve service. It wasn't going to be Christmas. I didn't know anyone in that church. The pastor came out. I'd never seen him before in my life. I didn't know who he was. And I had decided long before, but now it was confirmed that just this was not going to be Christmas. <clears throat> but then we started to sing some of the same songs that we've been singing here today. Songs that talk about the birth of a Savior. We have the same scripture readings that you've just heard today promising a savior coming and then the christmas story the true christmas story about the child born in a manger and at some point during that service it dawned on me all of these other things that i thought christmas was and that now i don't have anymore it's still christmas christmas is really quite simple it's not all of those other things that I made Christmas to be. Christmas wasn't a pork dinner. It wasn't snow on the ground. It wasn't a shiny neighborhood with a man in a Santa costume. It wasn't seeing my friends. Christmas is about Jesus being born in a manger who would then go to a cross and die there to take our sins away and rise from the dead. That's Christmas. So what is it like for you this year? What sort of things aren't there this year for you? Maybe you don't have the big family gatherings. Maybe you're not going to have all the parties. Maybe it just won't be the same. And have we thought that to ourselves? This just won't be Christmas. The simplicity of the Christmas story is so instructive to us this year. All of that other stuff. If we add more to something, doesn't it end up making something less? And maybe when we peel away all that we thought Christmas should be, we end up with something more. What it really is. The virus hasn't ruined Christmas this year. Christmas is as Christmas always was, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You and I are redeemed. Merry Christmas. Amen.
We stand for prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For Matthew Harrison, our synodical president, and Duane Luke, the district president, for all pastors in Christ and for all servants of the church and for all the people, let us pray to the Lord. For Donald Trump, our nation's president, for Tony Evers, our state's governor, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For international and national concerns, persecuted Christians, natural disaster victims, victims of senseless violence. For those in hospice care, Barb Flagstead, Ramona Kramer. Those suffering with COVID, Gretchen Baton. Comfort for the family and friends of those who have passed away, Carl Hazert. For those undergoing treatment, Lincoln Kennedy, Katie Klopek, Eleanor DeWinter, Sharon Eichmann, Ed Groh, Becky Holt Aufderheide, Lori Harris, Cindy Heitke, Derek Kosmicki, Susan Kufsky, Tiana Lang, Gail Mayton, Jennifer Nering, Roger Nowak, Jean Palomino, Dave Tucker, Glenda Whippenfirth. For those who are recovering, Doug Bale, Klaus Becker, Bruce Burt, Jenny Dopke, Dolores Dufek, Linda Hag, Karen Hansen, Brittany Hyde, Pastor Paul Pett, Don Smith, an unnamed kidney donor, an unnamed kidney recipient. For those who have ongoing health problems, Neil Anderson, Bob Barrett, Margie Bergelin, Laverne Burt, Jean Bussaro, Louise Christophils, Ed Forel, Luann Gersmaley, Janet Groh, Orville Howard and Vi Howard, Ron Howard, Sue Kynitz, Laura Lee, Susan Lutzo Buss, Tom Meath, Michelle Nguyen, Marshall and Sheila Piotr, Mary Pirlo, Jeanette Raditz, Phyllis Smeester, LaDonna Tratz, Bill Wagner, for all caregivers, for all families in crisis, for the school ministry of New Lutheran High School and Trinity Lutheran School, for the missionary overseas, Elliot and Serena Derricks, for military personnel, Christian Altergott, Paige Bogner, Tess and Sean LaRue, Roy McDonough, Garrett Moan, Maggie Knoll, Ron Pezzi, Nathan Schrader, Let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the saints, Let us commend ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ, our Lord.
We pray the collect for Christmas Eve. Let us pray. O oh God, you make us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that as we joyfully receive him as our Savior, we may with sure confidence behold him when he comes to be our judge. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, Let us bless the Lord. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. As, um, as we now light these candles, uh, you've done this before. You may be seated. You've done this before, you Lutherans who have been doing this for many years. We will light the candles from, I assume the usher will come to the aisles and you will dip your candle into theirs. Would you rather stand for Silent Night or be seated for Silent? You'd rather stand up, wouldn't you? Let's stand for Silent Night.
Lord, in your mercy. Please be seated. Reverend Taylor, thank you again for helping out today. And we want to ask that as uh, when you blow out your candle and there's some dried wax, uh, we're asked that you please don't pick it off, just leave it there, keep the hand or candle upright until you put it in the box back there. Otherwise, some of the wax tends to get into the carpeting or into the pew seats. So please be careful. So that's all I have. <laughs> I know Christmas is one of those really special church services and to be invited into this family uh, to celebrate it with you, I am honored and grateful. Thank you all uh, for, uh, for being here despite all that we're dealing with and uh, we will keep praying for Pastor Pet and uh, God's blessings to you all. Merry Christmas. <laughs>